Uh, can I share my screen? I don't have an option to at the moment. Yes, yes. Yeah, there is. Uh, OK, so just one second. So there is a third option for the sharing. Yeah, it's telling me that. Uh, third option in the bottom screen. Share button. Yeah, it's it's grayed out, so it doesn't. It's not an option for me. Oh, still. Yeah. It's asking me to open my system preferences. See if that if that helps. Okay, I'm now a host, so yeah. I can read so but, but I still can't share. In the bottom, there's the option, third option, there is a share. Yeah, is I'm clicking a... that, but I get a box that opens up that it says a, yeah. a lot of WebEx yeah, then, media. Right, you have to click that, and you have to click that uh, uh, share in that box. Yeah, it, it's. I'm, I'm having to reset my settings here. In order to share for some reason. It's not allowing me to. Um, okay. So we can click the option share and uh, you'll get the another pop up screen. So no, I don't. My pop-up screen just says that I, I have to allow WebEx meetings to record. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. You can okay, allow so that. Record you can first? Allow that. Yes. Record them. Uh, and now I cloud, I'll record. Okay. But I still don't have, the share option is still grayed out. Okay. Try clicking on that, but it doesn't, uh, it says I need to reset my computer uh, settings, which I've never had to do in WebEx before. Oh, okay, okay. So do you have the slides uh, which you can share and I can share from my side? I do, let's see, can I, is there a way to do that uh, with WebEx? Uh, or should I send them by email? Oh, you can send it by email. Okay, it's a very big file. Will, will your system accept it? Uh, yes, you should. Or you can try once again with the share option in the. So once you click, there will be a sh share content. Then you can click the the PPT screen and click share. Uh, where is that option? Yeah, you when you click the share option in the bottom of the screen, that uh, mute, stop video, and share. Yeah, I so just get a, a message that I have to open my system preferences. I don't get any other option. Okay, so when you click it, it's automatically show that share content screen no i don't get that at all okay 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 so you can email me the slides and i can uh, download okay. it and share it. let me see if that works i hope it does it's a large file okay okay so do you get this option in the top uh, menus as well we have file edit and share uh, top let, left. Me just, let me get this sent first and then, because uh, it's going to take a while, I think, for it to be sent. Uh, it's too big. It won't, my system won't send it. What was the other option? Yeah, so if you go on top left side, there are some uh, options like file, edit, share, view. Top left side, I see speaking. I see your name speaking. Top office speaking, yeah. 
uh, but there's no nothing else there. It's just said that it says that you're speaking. Gives you gives your name. Yeah, 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 yeah. So on the on the top of that, so probably maybe I don't know. Is it, nothing, is, maybe you are not else. getting the full screen. Full screen of WebEx probably is not. I'm, I'm not on full screen. Try transfer here under file. I'm trying to file transfer, but that, uh, okay, that, this may work. Okay, it says that I'm sharing the file. Yeah, it's 190 yeah. megabytes. I've actually sent it twice. Do you see anything uh, coming in your way? So not it. It's just saying that sharing the file that the top of. I'm currently downloading the file, uh, so yeah. Are you able to download it? Yes, sir. It's downloading, sir. Okay, it's taking it's some time. Good. Yeah, in the meantime, you can try the share option in the topmost screen also. File, edit, and share. Yeah, that's what I was asking. That's what I did. Yeah. Okay, in the the share option in the topmost file edit and third option is a share. So where you can I click the share. options are not coming to him, Gopi. Okay, or you can press the control shift D. I have a Mac. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> if the files are if the if, if the file is sending, then that should be the best way. I don't yeah, know if yeah. you can tell. It's uh, 190.5 megabytes. Oh, okay, okay. So maybe it's taking. Maybe I can start by giving just a little bit of background while the slides are downloading. Uh, uh, yes, uh, just maybe we can wait for another two minutes, then we can. OK. See the so maybe did you get a chance to download the complete one? So it's at 12% right now. Oh, oh. 12%? It's, it's 12 a big file. It's, it's a big file, Gopi. It will take time. Maybe. It's a good idea to start meanwhile. Maybe he can start right. giving introduction without slides. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Let me do that. Um, okay. So my apologies, everyone, for the technical difficulties. Um, we use WebEx relatively frequently here and uh, without, without problems normally, but uh, for some reason, the, it's not allowing me to share. So. Um, uh, as you heard, I'm, I'm, my name is Roger Cam. I'm from the biological and mechanical engineering departments at MIT. And um, over the past 15 years, our lab has been working on the development of microphysiological models 
Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what microphysiological models are, but I need to give you a little bit of background first. Um, there are three main events or three main developments that have occurred in the last 15 years or so that have really paved the way for the, the work that I'm going to be talking about. Um, one is the success of iPS cells uh, in a variety of settings. Um, this was first developed by Yamanaka's group in Japan in 2006, uh, but then since has been expanded so that at this point we can really derive, first of all, these uh, pluripotent uh, stem cells from anyone's fibroblasts, dermal fibroblasts, for example. Uh, we can then differentiate those pluripotent cells, the iPS cells, into a variety of different uh, organ-specific cells. So that's really opened up an opportunity to develop um, what, what I'm going to be referring to as microphysiological systems. Second development is uh, the fact that we can take these cells, the, any type of pluripotent cell, and form clusters and uh, differentiate those clusters into organ models or organoids. Um, it was initially done for optic cup, uh, again by a Japanese group in 2011. Um, but now we have organoids for a variety of different organs, for brain, for liver, for lung, for kidney. Um, and, and these organoids, um, they uh, are able to um, reproduce certain functionalities of the, of the organs. They can't completely replace all functions, uh, and they're not at a point where they can be implanted and be of much benefit to the patient, but the technology is rapidly developing. And then the, the third technology that, that uh, has come onto the scene is uh, organ, which you probably have heard of as organ on a chip models. Uh, these organ on a chip models are what I consider to be engineered models for the most part, where you can take these different types of cells. They can be either IPS drive cells or primary cells, uh, put them into a microfluidic device uh, and arrange them in such a way that they recapitulate certain um, uh, aspects of organ function. And these have been done um, on relatively small platforms to go up to 10 organs on one chip. Uh, and again, that work's been, it, it goes back to about 2010, maybe 2005, some initial work. Uh, but that field has just exploded in, in the past several years. So if, if you think about microphysiological systems, there, there are several aspects that I look for and, and try to reproduce in the systems that, that we create. Um, one is that we try to produce systems that, that uh, uh, can recapitulate real organ form and function. So they look like the organ, they function like the organ, and they can actually uh, be used, for example, for screening purposes, drug screening purposes. Uh, they're generally based on microfluidic technologies. Um, the 3D aspect is very important because most organs are three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. So it's important that we able to that we're able to see the cells in, in a three-dimensional matrix. And we can use not only um, uh, uh, primary cells that are derived from the patient uh, or derived from um, cell lines or iPS cells, but we can also use patient-specific cells. So, for example, we can take biopsy specimens from cancer patients. We can either dissociate those cells or even use them in a cluster, put them into um, a microphysiological model, and then that cluster of cells behaves in, in certain ways like the patient tumor. And we can use that then um, for uh, a variety of purposes, and in particular, um, uh, patient-specific studies looking at optimizing therapy. Um, these are not what pharma pharmaceutical companies would consider to be high throughput, but they can be at least moderate throughput studies. Um, uh, on a, on a 96-well uh, plate format, we can have probably 40 different experiments going. Um, uh, our work in our lab is especially focused on vascularization. Um, any organ, most organs actually, are, are vascularized. There are a few exceptions, not many, uh, but it's been very difficult to get capillary level vascularization of the organoids uh, or of the organ systems uh, that can be perfused and so, so as to maintain these organs for a long time. Uh, but that's rapidly changing, and I hope that uh, within a matter of a uh, couple of years, we'll be able to do that. Uh, and then finally, what, what are the, what's the use of these systems? Well, um, right now, most of them are being used for um, 
either disease models or in some cases for drug screening by pharmaceutical companies. So we now have a industry consortium that we're developing here at MIT that has uh, over 20 companies that are interested in uh, developing organ um, uh, drug screening platforms or disease models that are useful in developing new drugs. Um, in, the, in the talk that I'm going to give, uh, just as a, a, an overview, I'm going to start by talking about the work that we've been doing on developing microvascular networks. So these are the smallest capillary beds in the body, the smallest vessels. They run down to about 10 microns in diameter. And what I'm going to show you is that uh, these can be grown by self-assembly. Second part of my talk is once we have these vascular networks, we'd like to be able to characterize them in various ways, especially in terms of their functionality. And for that, we often look at the transport property. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how intravascular and transmural flow affect the transport. Um, one particular organ that's of, of interest is the, uh, is the brain and the blood-brain barrier. Um, as many of you probably know, the, the vessels, the blood vessels in the brain, are the, 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 they're the tight, tightest vascular system in the body. Um, and, uh, but yet, uh, it's one of the primary sites, for example, for metastasis, uh, cancer metastasis. So we've been doing studies to try to understand why that is. What makes the brain such a receptive organ for metastatic cancer? So the next part of my talk, I'll talk a little bit about um, models for metastasis to the brain, and then also uh, looking at primary cancer, primary brain cancers, such as glioblastoma, um, how we might be able to deliver um, therapeutics, for, for example, cisplatin, across the blood-brain barrier in order to treat uh, brain cancers. And then in the final part of my talk, I'll talk some about uh, the models that we've developed for Alzheimer's disease and also for, uh, for ALS, uh, two diseases for which we really have very few. Uh, we have no cures. Uh, we have few treatments. Um, some of you may have heard of a, a new drug for Alzheimer's disease that Biogen has recently introduced. Um, but it's a very expensive drug, and it really hasn't proven efficacy yet. Uh, hasn't proved to be effective in, in actually reversing the, um, uh, the devastating uh, neurological effects of, of, uh, of, Al of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So, um, I guess I can also, at the beginning of my talk, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the the funders, the collaborators, and students who have done all the work. Um, I will flash this page up when, this, when the slides get downloaded, uh, but I just wanted to acknowledge them right now, especially the funding that we've had from the National Institutes of Health at MI, at, uh, in the U.S., um, the National Cancer Institute, and the National Institute for Neurological Disease and Stroke, um, and, and also a worldwide program that's being run by the Wellcome Trust Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, uh, that has funded a group of, of scientists around the world to de further develop these organoid systems so that they can be used for drug screening. And of course, I, I have a fantastic lab of, um, I'd say, t about 13 or 14 individuals right now, uh, the majority of whom are postdocs, but I also have several graduate students. Uh, that have contributed to the work that I'm going to present today. And then uh, one announcement I was going to make is that there's a, a Keystone Symposium, which is going to be uh, uh, held in person in Keystone, Colorado. I realize it's a very long trip from India, but uh, if any of you are interested in uh, either organoid systems or engineering multicellular living systems, which is what we call, refer to our work as, um, that would be an excellent meeting to attend. That's April 3rd through 6th. Uh, this would be a good time to transfer to the slides. Are we making good progress on that? Oh, 66 percentage, so uh, maybe another two, three 60. minutes it take. Okay, okay. Let's see what else I can, I can talk about here. Um, we can uh, talk about the companies like uh, uh, what kind of product and uh, like we can also uh, give a suggestions like suppose someone want to start a startup company and okay. what would be the sure. ideal way so I, I as was mentioned earlier I, i've had two startup companies one cardiovascular technologies 
was really based on a, um, an idea that a vascular surgeon friend and I had um, that uh, led to a patent, which we developed on our own. He was a surgeon at Mass General, and I'm still on the faculty at MIT. But we did this sort of on the side. We did it in our garage uh, or in our basements, basically. And um, that company, we, we developed a prototype, uh, but it turned out that uh, our patent was very timely. It was a blocking patent for a lot of ideas that other companies were coming up with. So we wound up selling the patent to another startup, which was subsequently purchased by Boston Scientific. Um, so we did very little work. Uh, we had a, a it was be very beneficial to us, um, but it, I wouldn't say that we had a, a lot of experience in actually setting up a company. Uh, AIM Biotech uh, is a company that I started in about 2000. 14, I think it was, uh, in Singapore. So I had a lab both in, at MIT and in Singapore. Um, I had some of these ideas that we had, that our lab had developed on microfluidic technologies here at MIT, and had carried over a lot of that work to Singapore. And um, Singapore had an innovation program that I linked up with. And through that program, um, we I, I enlisted the help of uh, uh, a, a recent uh, MBA graduate, somebody who had, um, had experience in the uh, device, uh, medical device uh, area. Um, he wrote a business plan for us as part of um, uh, this innovation program. And we were able to uh, raise some funds to start the company there. So the, the company started in Singapore. Um, it uh, ramped up relatively slowly. We didn't have a lot of funding, so it was and, and it was difficult to raise uh, the initial funding in Singapore, but we did manage to keep things going. We hired a few of my a former postdoc, a former um, uh, graduate student of mine from Singapore, um, and then an engineer who had worked with the, uh, the CEO of the company. Uh, that company has grown. We uh, just last year had our Series A funding. And for those of you who know startups, uh, Series A is the first uh, substantial funding. Before that, we had uh, angel investors. Uh, that kept the company going, got us, uh, allowed us to build a foundation, develop a product where we started to have income. Uh, and now we are going through a process whereby we uh, do what's called an inversion. We're bringing the company to the U.S. because it's important in raising funds for the company that we have access to uh, the venture capital companies here in the U.S. And that process is, uh, should be completed by the end of this year. And then we will go for Series B funding. And uh, it's, it's a space where we're developing platforms that would enable people to develop microphysiological models. I'll actually show on one of my slides the, the basic concept behind the microfluidic system. It's very simple. Uh, the technology is not high. Uh, I would say the complexity in these models arises mostly from the cells that you put in them and how the cells interact. Um, and, and that's where uh, the, the Science and Technology Center that I've directed uh, for the past 10 years comes into play because what the, the focus of that is called emergent behaviors of integrated cellular systems. Now that's kind of a mouthful, but what it means is that we were looking to understand how cell populations of different cell types interact with each other, understand that at a fundamental level, so we can use that to develop these larger scale systems. Um, things like organs on a chip, uh, brain models, uh, model for ALS, types of things that I'll be talking about during my presentation. Um, the company at this point, we're just rolling out several new products. We've had a, a very narrow product line initially, but uh, uh, sales have continued to ramp up um, at, a, at a healthy rate. And um, I don't think we have much going on in India right now. So it'd be an interesting opportunity to take advantage of there. Um, some of the new products that we have online are higher throughput version of the system that we currently have. And then secondly, uh, in fact, I can show that system to you here. It's really very, very simple. This is a, a 96 well format plate. Here you see three experiments and a chip that slips into these devices. And this is something that can be sold relatively inexpensively so that any lab, really any lab that does biological experiments can very 
quickly get up to speed in developing more complex 3D models. Um, there's a, there's a, a certain amount of uh, uh, a certain barrier that biologists have to get over in order to enter into um, doing 3D models. But uh, we find that with a little bit of hand holding and a little bit of training, that uh, even bi strict molecular biology labs can very soon start to do uh, meaningful 3D models and, and working with organoids and working with organoid systems. So that's where our company stands right now. Um, I have, in fact, a, uh, uh, a number of students, um, the Indian students uh, from India that I've worked with in the past, uh, a lot of them have had a very entrepreneurial bent. Um, in fact, I'd say uh, three at least have gone into uh, either consulting or startup companies, and they've been very successful at it. Uh, there's a recent graduate here um, uh, who is currently looking, he just recently graduated, and he's looking to um, uh, initiate a startup company um, with some of the ideas that he developed during his PhD. So it's very doable. Uh, there's a lot of venture capital funding around uh, as long as you have a good idea and as long as you're able to sell that idea, which I think is an important part of it. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. I guess another thing that I could say, oops, it looks like something's happening. Yeah, now the slides are available. They are. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, can, you, can you share them on the screen? Okay. All right. So I guess you have to operate these though, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. This is my acknowledgement slide that I talked about. Next slide. And if you go two more clicks, this is what I was talking about in terms of the key developments that uh, occurred over the last 15 years, the IPS cells, the organoids, and the organ on chip models. Uh, next slide. And I, I've talked through this slide, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about microphysiological systems and the attributes that are important, at least from my perspective, are the ones that are listed here that I've talked through. Next slide. And here's one of the companies. AIM Biotech is the company that I referred to. Uh, you can see there there's a, a region, um, uh, Agenta region in the center, where you can see that's where a three-dimensional gel is placed. Uh, cells can be suspended in that gel, and then we have access to the two side channels, the aqua and the blue channel, uh, for media, and also for generating flows and pressure drops and concentration gradients. Um, a, a, variant, a variation on this design is shown just below. This is the one that we're currently using for organoids. Uh, some of the unique aspects of this are, one, when you put a cover slip on it to close the, the, the channels that you see there, uh, you can really image using any uh, of the common modalities, you see, the ones you see listed here. Uh, we can also do a variety of different biochemical or omic analyses. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some RT-PCR studies that we've done, some cytokine arrays and mass spectrometry, for example. And we can also do functional ass assays or functional assessment of these models. Um, I'll talk about um, permeability, uh, leakage, um, a measure of leakage of the vascular system. Here's a, uh, just a trajectories of cell migration. So we can look at tumor cell extravasation, which I'll show you. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the overview. Uh, next slide. I'm going to initially focus on uh, growing how we develop the microvascular networks. Uh, again, they're using a device slightly different from the one that's shown in the upper right, but basically the same. And I'm going to show you four videos, and it'll probably show actually better from your computer than they will from mine, I hope. Uh, the first one is how these vascular networks actually develop from endothelial cells. This is a 24-hour time-lapse movie uh, where you can see the endothelial cells. They, they, they reach out, they connect with their neighbors, and they form this nice three-dimensional network. 
uh, if you let that network go for about four to seven days, uh, it becomes luminized. So it's actually a, a, a hollow uh, network that we can then perfuse through from the sides. You go to the next slide. And we can perfuse various things into that network. Here, what, what you see, the green circles are tumor cells that we flowed into the vascular networks. The vascular network is shown in red here. And um, what you see in this four hour time lapse movie is that these tumor cells, once they get into the capillary network, they become activated and they start to transmigrate. Um, so you can see the ones that become sort of elongated are tumor cells that have gotten into the dark region around the vascular network, which is a three dimensional matrix, which would represent the tissue of, of an organ. Next slide. We can go to higher magnification. This is uh, zeroing in on one of those capillaries where you see um, what starts out to be two tumor cells, red tumor cells adjacent to one another inside the green capillary network. Um, and what in this, uh, again, it's a four hour time lapse movie, but what you see is that there's a gap that opens up between the two adjacent endothelial cells. And then as that's open, right, right now, that tumor cell is escaping out into the surrounding matrix. And you can see the, the faint red in the surrounding uh, tissue uh, indicating that the tumor cell has gotten out. So this is the kind of imaging that we can do. Next slide. Uh, another aspect of this is that we can generate flow. Um, this movie sometimes isn't so pixelated, but I think you get the idea. The red cells there are neutrophils. Again, this is a four hour time lapse movie. The neutrophils are moving around very rapidly. The two green cells are tumor cells. And during the course of this uh, four hour time lapse movie, the one tumor cell on the bottom uh, slowly escapes uh, across again, just like I was showing in the previous slide, into the surrounding tissue. And it turns out that there's signaling between the neutrophils and the tumor cell it actually enhances the ability of the tumor cell to escape and then form a metastatic tumor. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna say a little bit about the vascular networks and I'll probably go through this a little bit quickly because I realize that we've, we're running behind time. Um, what you see here in the lower left-hand image, uh, the green are endothelial cells, the red are fibroblasts that we use as supporting cells to develop these vascular ne networks. Uh, the, the fibroblasts uh, wind up uh, wrapping around the endothelial cells in some cases, looking very much like a, another cell type called a pericyte. Um, and we were interested in looking at the matrix and how that matrix was being modified over time. So this is after seven days uh, after these networks have formed. You can see a nice clear lumen here. Um, but the matrix has been highly remodeled. There are holes, there are regions of dense matrix. So we wanted to figure out what was going on there. Uh, next slide. So what we did is we used mass spec. We took the matrices, matrices that you see on the left-hand side. We desaturized them. We removed all the cells. Uh, and then we broke up the matrix, uh, cut it up, and did mass spec on it to analyze what the composition was. And there were a couple of surprises that came out of the study. One is that if we had either the endothelial cells by themselves, these are the Huvex cells, or the fibroblasts, these are the NHLF cells, um, either by themselves, they, they didn't generate too much matrix. So the matrix composition, composition didn't change very much. Uh, on the left-hand side, though, you can see that if we had the two cell types together, there was a lot of bidirectional signaling. And as a result of this bidirectional signaling, we had a whole range of different uh, matrix molecules that were generated, that were secreted by the cells and were incorporated into the matrix. In fact, on the right-hand side, you can see a pie chart showing, first of all, that about a third of the matrix uh, that we analyzed was secreted by the cells relative to the original matrix that we had, the fibrin matrix. And it had a wide spectrum of different uh, compositions. The collagens are there, the fibrins there, so forth. Uh, most of what you would expect to find in the extracellular matrix. Uh, next slide. For the me mechanical engineers in the crowd, uh, we also looked at the mechanical properties and how those changed over time, because obviously the composition was changing, so too with the mechanics. In this case, what we did is we used uh, AFM. We took the device, we removed the cover slip, we could bring an AFM probe in and do indentation and study what would happen to the elastic modulus or the Young's modulus uh, over time in different settings. And I'll just draw your attention to the 
the uh, magenta, the JCC. This is when the two cell types, the endothelial cells and fibroblasts are in the same matrix. Um, that modulus goes from about 100 pascal up to about a one kilopascal over a seven day period. Um, interestingly, what we found is that that increase in matrix in, in stiffness was due to two factors. Uh, and if you look, look over on the right hand side, uh, what you find the same type of plot. This is again, uh, this is the full change in elastic modulus as a function of time. Uh, and just look at the F, the fibroblast plus endothelial cell, the ones with the yellow bars over them. There's a pro progressive increase, but notice that here what we've done is we've killed the cells. We've gone in and, and prevented the cells from contracting. And it's the contraction of the cells that generates, um, it moves the stress strain curve of the material into a nonlinear portion. Uh, so it's a much stiffer material. Um, and when you relax the cells or remove the cells, they go from, in this case, about a, a kilopascal down to something that would be even more in the range of, of maybe 400 pascal or less. So there are two factors. One is the change in composition. The other is the tension that's being exerted on the matrix due to the cell contraction. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these vessels, they, I mentioned that they grow in about four to seven days, but um, they can be uh, also made to last for long term. Here you can see we've taken this out eight weeks. Uh, these are the vessels on the left-hand side and the red here on the right is a dextran dye, just a dye that we should flow in to de demonstrate that they're still perfusible. Next slide. And we can also make these, uh, we can immortalize these, produce immortalized cell lines by introducing something called HTERT. And here it just shows that the same networks can be developed up to passage 20. Next slide, please. So what do we do with these networks? Um, first of all, we characterize them in terms of their functionality. Uh, these are networks that have been de developed with different cell types. Uh, generally, we use uh, a combination of one endothelial cell type and one stromal cell type. Um, so these are the different endothelial cells. We use the human umbilical vein endothelial cells are kind of our workhorse. We do a lot of experiments with those. But we can also get endothelial cells from iPS cells. We can get primary cells from the brain, or we can get primary cells from um, patient-specific tumors. Um, different types of, of stromal cells can be used in co-culture, and they generally form networks of the type that you see here. Uh, next slide, please. So what about the transport properties? So here we're generating flows. Uh, we use a very simple pumping system that we developed in the lab. Uh, there's nothing complicated about this. We try to keep things simple as much as possible. But what that enables us to do is to control uh, pressures on the left-hand media channel. That would be P1 here, the right-hand media channel. And then in a port that connects with the matrix material in, in the center region. By doing so, we can generate um, pressure gradients across the vascular network between one channel to the other, giving rise to luminal flow and flows inside the, the, the vessels. Uh, or we can generate a pressure gradient between the inside of the vessel and the matrix outside, that's this pressure drop, uh, and then we can generate interstitial flows. So we're interested in how both the, trans, the intravascular and the transmural flows influence transport. Next slide, please. So if you click on each of these boxes, uh, movies will start, I think. Uh, here again, I'm just showing you that we can generate this intravascular flow. These are microbeads that are flowing through the microvascular network. Uh, in the center movie, uh, we're changing the transmural pressure. Uh, what you'll see is at some point, these vessels expand a little bit and then they contract. So we were using about a one kilopascal pressure. And then on the right-hand side, it shows how we measure the interstitial flow. Uh, we use a method called FRAP. Um, uh, and what we do is we photo bleach a spot, and then we follow that spot as it moves with the interstitial flow. And we can then measure, we can quantify the interstitial flow through the matrix. Uh, next slide, please. So we can generate a lot of the different types of flows that you have in vivo. Uh, one of the applications in the model is to, is to analyze the transport across the vessel barrier, across the endothelial barrier. And that can occur either by passive transport, 
uh, between adjacent cells here in the tight junctions, or by active transport, by transcytosis, for example. And that's more common uh, in terms of transporting large molecules that are too large to fit through this tight junction space, or nanoparticles. And these are drawn roughly in scale between the small molecules, the large proteins, um, monoclonal antibodies, for example, and then the nanoparticles. Next slide. So here, measurements of permeability. And think of permeability as the level of leakiness, a measure of leakiness um, of stuff out of the vessel into the surrounding matrix. Uh, here on the left-hand side, this is with no transferal flow. So we just, everything is static. There's no flow going across the vessel wall. So P1 is equal to P2 is equal to P3. Uh, and as we measure the permeability of different solute molecules, you can see there's a dependence on molecular weight but also that there's a difference between the 2D in vitro models and the 3D in vitro models, which is one reason why it's so important to us that we have, have the right morphology of these vascular networks rather than rely on, for example, these transfer systems that are planar in geometry. Um, if we add transmural flow to the system, uh, the apparent permeability or the, the leakiness goes up. Uh, this is for a small molecule, just the fluorophore itsy. Uh, if we have uh, fluorescently tagged uh, proteins of different sizes. These are dextrans. You can see again that as we increase the transmural pressure, that's on the vertical axis or horizontal axis, uh, it goes up to uh, one kilopascal. We get a progressive increase in the transport rates. And, and from data like this, we can back out what the hydraulic conductivity is, uh, that the flow resistance of the vascular wall and also something called the reflection coefficient. To what extent is the molecule being filtered out by the space constraints of the molecule? Next slide, please. So using a system like this, we can now for the first time, uh, in vitro, we can start to distinguish between active transport and pericellular transport. Active transport is the transcytosis that I referred to going through the cell, which is an active process of the cell. So it's gonna be temperature dependent but uh, transmural pressure independent. Uh, this is by means of vesicles that you see here that can either be attached or in transit. Um, and here what we've done is we've used two uh, common biological molecules, albumin and IgG. And what you notice is in contrast to the, the dextrans that I showed you in the last slide, these two molecules turn out, to, their permeability turns out to be independent of the transmural pressure. So, suggesting that it's not just a pressure-driven flow between the cells that's giving rise to an increase in permeability that's not occurring here, uh, which would suggest that it's the transport is more of an active uh, process. And over here on the right, what we've done is we've done these same measurements at two different temperatures, a high temperature and a low temperature, both for IgG and for a, 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 a dextran molecule, 150 kilodalton dextran, which happens to be about the same size as IgG. Here you can see the permeability is independent of temperature for this molecule, which is transported between the cells, between the endothelial cells, but has a strong temperature dependence um, in the case of transcytosis. Uh, next slide, please. So a blood-brain barrier, there are a number of different um, ways in which material substances can get across the blood-brain barrier. Uh, what I'm gonna focus on here is just the that there are three main cell types in the barrier. One is the endothelial cell itself, another is basement, the pericyte, and then the astrocyte. Um, so what we did in the next slide, if somebody could tell me how much time more I should, I should take, uh, that would be helpful and I can gauge things accordingly. Yeah, that's 15 minutes. 15 minutes, perfect, okay. So here what we've done is we've uh, taken these three cell types uh, the endothelial cells that are derived from, from iPS cells, um, and then primary bu brain, uh, human brain pericytes and primary human brain astrocytes. We mix them in with a matrix. We inject them into the center region in the device, same device that I've shown you before. And then they form these networks, just like the ones that I've shown before. And the cells are, take on a morphology and a, 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 an arrangement that mimics what you see in the brain. Um, they also mimic functionally what you find in terms of the permeability of the blood-brain barrier uh, with these three human cell types. And the measurements that we've made are these 
uh, square boxes, and you can see they fall right inside the range of measurements that were made in rats, and this is in rat brains, uh, in vivo, uh, for an, a variety of different molecules of different, uh, different size. So functionally, it looks very much like the, the blood-brain barrier. Uh, next slide. Uh, we've looked more closely, we've analyzed, um, we've used both EM that you see here um, to analyze and, and look at the uh, junction between endothelial cells. And here you can see it's almost what's called a seamless junction where it starts to fuse between the cells. Um, click there and you can see the, the red astrocyte, um, magenta astrocyte and the green endothelial cell. And then here you can see the, the three cell types together. And they're, they're taking on an arrangement around the endothelial cell, much what, like what you'd expect to see. Um, next slide. Uh, we can look at it histologically. Uh, and I'm going to show you some RT-PCR data in a minute. But basically what the, what the BBB model that we've developed uh, is capable of is that it has this in vivo-like morphology. Uh, we can create it from primary or iPS cells. Um, the permeability values match, which we find in vivo. Uh, I'll show you some of the, the phenotypic data in just a minute. Um, it requires just a single injection of cells, so it's really a very simple model to accomplish. And uh, it can be created with uh, a commercial ship chip. This is actually a higher throughput version of the same chip that I showed you before. Next slide. And these are some of the RT-PCR data. And I'm going to show you... Uh, draw your attention to a couple things. If you put, click uh, once, actually click twice. There we go, once more, yeah. Okay, so uh, here I'm showing the difference in, uh, the, the first five rows here are, are junctional proteins, actually all the way down to VECAT here. And these are junctional proteins. Uh, we're showing the expression of in these different uh, cells under different culture conditions that I'll talk about. The bottom group of, of genes correspond to uh, brain-specific proteins that tend to be upregulated in the blood-brain barrier. The two, first two columns are cells that are um, plated in 2D, and then the right-hand three columns are in 3D. Uh, here I'm drawing your attention to, if we take the primary cells, culture them either in 2D or 3D, you can see there's a huge difference in the level of expression of these uh, junctional proteins, which should be highly regulated in the brain because it's so tight, uh, and also these brain-specific proteins. So it, it's important that you not just culture this, these cells in 2D and then try to analyze their, their phenotype. Next slide. Oops, went too far. Uh, go back, back. Yeah, that's fine. So here you can, okay. So here you can see uh, the difference between uh, the iPS-derived endothelial cells either in 2D or, or in the 3D co-culture system, and you can see there's a huge difference again in the phenotype as, as reflected in the uh, upregulation of all these brain-specific proteins. Uh, I'm not going to go into, into this in detail, but uh, just to give you a visual representation of the fact that these iPS ECs are really becoming brain-like through the signaling that they, that they undergo with the pericytes and the astrocytes. Next slide, please. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, metastatic cancer. And specifically, we're thinking about cells that break loose from the primary tumor over on the left-hand side. They enter into the circulation. They intravasate. And then they become circulating tumor cells where they can become convected to another part of the body. They get stuck or they adhere to the endothelium. They transmigrate, undergo transendothelial migration. And then they get out into the tissue and they can either become dormant, they can proliferate, or they can die. Next slide, please. So we're looking mainly at the peripheral site. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the brain and metastasis of different types of cancer to the brain. Um, here's the model that we talked about before. This is the blood-brain barrier model with three cell types. And we've actually added the fourth cell type. The white cells are the tumor cells that have been flowed into the vascular network so that we can observe their extravasation out into the tissue. And what we find is that as you go from a, a very simple system of just the endothelial cells by themselves, adding either the astrocytes or the pericytes, or adding the combination, the triculture system, 
And what I'll really draw your attention to is the, uh, the difference between the left hand dark blue bar and the right hand light blue bar. Um, for these different cell lines, these are two different breast cancer cell lines. Uh, you see a dramatic increase in the rate of extravasation, the rate at which these cells escape into the tissue during a 24 hour period. Um, and it doesn't matter too much whether you're looking at breast cancer cells or lung cancer or prostate carcinoma, you, they all show pretty much the same phenomenon. Even though the barrier is getting tighter as you go from the left to the right, the extravasation rate, which you'd think would be a function of how tight this barrier is, extravasation rate's actually going up rather than going down. So we wanted to try to understand that a little bit. Next slide. So what we did is we took, um, actually, let me skip over this. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we did is we did a, a cytokine array that you see on the bottom, looking for factors that were being secreted by the astrocytes, because it was the astrocytes that seemed to have the biggest effect on increasing the extra extravasation rate of tumor cells into the brain. Um, and here I'll just draw your attention to the CCL2, which when you have the astrocytes combined with the tumor cells, uh, they're this is upregulated about five-fold compared to just having the endothelial cells with the tumor cells by themselves. And here you can see the, the cytokine array. And, and as you went from just an endothelial cell system to the, 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 the co-culture system with astrocytes, you got this five-fold increase in the secretion. So we thought CCL2 looks like a, a likely candidate. So in the next slide, you see that we tested that. We tested it in two ways. One is we took um, either the monoculture system, just the vascular network by itself with the endothelial cells, or the endothelial cells with the pericytes. So we wouldn't expect the CCL2 to be secreted from the astrocytes because the astrocytes aren't present here. And we saw a dose-dependent increase in the extravasation rate of the tumor cells uh, with, C with recombinant CCL2 that we added. Um, and also with the pericytes, we saw the same thing. Uh, next click. And then what we did is we took the triculture system, the, remember the endothelial cells, the pericytes, and the astrocytes, and now we blocked the CCL2. We put in an anti-CCL2, and in a dose-dependent manner, it reduces the extravasation rate. Next slide, please. And here what we've done is we, there's another factor that had been implicated, this st galnex 5 um, and so we looked at the combination of blocking CCL2 and the ST6 and found that we could actually, through a combination treatment, we could reduce the extravasation rate even more. This is a, we're, we're blocking the ST6 and the CCR2 in the tumor cells. The CCR2 is the receptor that the CCL2 binds to. And you could see we could get a dramatic reduction in these brain metastatic cells. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, oftentimes when we submit uh, a publication for review that's just based on in vitro studies, the reviews come back saying, well, that's very nice, but why don't you do the studies in the mouse? Uh, so that was one of these cases. And we actually anticipated that, so we did the confirmation in the mouse and saw essentially the same effect here on the right-hand side. You can see this is the percent extravasation at 24 and 48 hours, uh, the control as the red, and when we block the CCR2 receptor, or when we knock down the CCR2 receptor uh, through shRNA, you can see we get a dramatic reduction in the extravasation rates. Next slide, please. And here, what we've done is we've used that same model to look at introducing particles, nanoparticles, and how we can use nanoparticles to target glioblastoma tumors. Um, next slide. We use three different uh, surface modifications of the nanoparticles, either bare nanoparticles, these are lipid nanoparticles, or, or functionalized with uh, different, uh, here this is an angiopep2 and this is transferrin, um, different receptors um, that we thought that are known to uh, enhance delivery into the brain. And sure enough, what we found is that we can use this in vitro model to actually demonstrate uh, a higher rate of killing of tumor cells in the brain model, the one that you're see, seeing over here, relative to either the free um, cisplatin 
this is a cis cisplatin added to the interior of the nanoparticle uh, or the bare um, nanoparticles or the AP2 nanoparticles. Next slide, please. And I'm going to skip over this. This is a model that we have for Alzheimer's. And one more. And there we are. So the model that we're currently working on is a, it's, a, it's an organoid-like model. It uses, uses the device that you see up here. But now we want to be able to have a vascular network around the neural tissue, um, which in A, the dark, the, the bright green is the neural tissue. Uh, the green around the outside is the blood-brain barrier. And if you look in the lower right in the figure F, you can see the BBB. This is at a higher magnification. And then these are... Um, stem cells that have been modified to overexpress a beta 40 or a beta 42 so that they recapitulate some aspects of a brain tumor. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, what I want to talk about is this ALS model that we developed um, where we're trying to recapitulate the motor unit. What we do is we introduce um, cells that have been differentiated from either ES cells or IPS cells into motor neurons. We introduce them in the left-hand side of this uh, system, and we introduce muscle cells that are also iPS-derived in the right-hand side. Um, over a period of 14 days in co-culture, these neurons reach out, they form these neurite and form synapses with the muscle on the right-hand side, which is shown in red. And then we can activate this because these are modified uh, to express what's called channel rhodopsin. So we can use optogenetics to shine light on the neurons to activate the muscle. And when we activate the muscle, we can measure the contractile force because these posts that the muscle is mounted on are flexible, so they can move as the muscle contracts. So in the next slide, shows some of the results that we obtain. Uh, here is just uh, some more images of the, uh, showing the neurites going into the muscle and then branching and then forming synapses with the individual muscle cells. Uh, for, and then we then can use uh, something like glutamic acid to demonstrate uh, activation. And then the next slide, what we've done is we've taken uh, that model uh, and now generated it either from healthy cells, from a healthy patient, or from a patient with ALS to see whether we could actually distinguish differences in the model between the two iPS-derived cells. And we use two different... Uh, therapies, basudinib and rapamycin, uh, which are currently being used in either a phase one or phase two clinical uh, trial. Uh, and we found, I'll, I'll show, let me just show you the lower right-hand graph. Uh, this is cell death. This, these, this is cell death in the muscle. Um, and you can see in the healthy muscle, it's very low. Uh, as if we use the ALS cells, you can see we're starting to get significant muscle cell death Despite the fact that the muscle in these two cases is, is the same muscle, derived from the same cells, and you can see here that the treatments, either the rapamycin or the rapamycin in combination with the basudinib, uh, give rise to a reduction in cell death. And therefore, um, it's probably the autophagy uh, capabilities of these drugs um, that uh, they both increase autophagy and therefore they can reduce the, the cell death. So next slide. This is just a summary of what I've talked about. Uh, maybe what I can do is leave this up. Uh, and uh, if we have any time for questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, and again, my apologies for the technical problems at the beginning. I hope that uh, I didn't have to rush too much and that I was able to get um, give you some idea of the kind of work that we do. Um, and also, if any questions that I don't have a chance to answer today, uh, please feel free to, to ask by email. Um, I get a pile of emails, but I, I do my best to respond to them. Again, thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation to, to speak. Yeah, thank you, Professor Rajat. Uh, now the session is open for a uh, couple of questions. Like, if any students have any questions, you can uh, type in the chat box. So, on behalf of you, I can read the questions to Professor Rajat. So uh, let me start with the, the some questions like, uh, for example, like uh, if we make, make the, the microfluidic model, like how much close we can mimic the original condition, like 
or how much close or better than the animal model or is it intermediate between the animal model and human? Um, a lot depends on what aspect you're, you're looking into. Um, what we try to do is we use two metrics. One is we, we use metrics to describe the morphology of the vascular net network. Uh, and the other is the functionality. And I think in terms of organ specific models, it's really the function that you're most interested in. Um, and there, you know, it's people are working on, on that, you know, trying to address that your question in a variety of different organ systems. Uh, the one that we focused on is the brain. So I, let me let me address the uh, question in that context. In terms of functionality, um, Everything that we've looked at so far in terms of transport characteristics of the blood brain barrier transport into the brain uh, has been quite well recapitulated with, with the model. Uh, if you look at the um, relative cell numbers um, for astrocytes, pericytes, and endothelial cells, we had to titrate it a little bit different from what you see in vivo, but not very much. So even the cell ratios are, are relatively good. Um, of course, at this point, uh, that model doesn't have any neurons and it doesn't have microglia. So uh, at that stage, you know, what I showed you in terms of the blood-brain barrier studies was just the blood-brain barrier. What we're currently doing is working with a colleague here at MIT, uh, Rudolf Janisch, who does a lot of work with uh, embryonic stem cells or iPS cells. And he differentiates all these cells, uh, all the neuronal cells from iPS. Uh, we're now just in the process of constructing our microfluidic models, our microphysiological models from these IPS models. And then we identify the different metrics that we want to use. Um, and it really is a variety. Um, uh, some, what we're trying to reproduce right now is the formation in the brain of the um, uh, plaques that are generated from the A beta protein. So we have cells that overexpress A beta. Um, that generally is a long-term process in, in humans. So we we express overexpress the A beta at a high level. So in that sense, we're not trying to reproduce exactly what happens in the body. What we're trying to speed it up a little bit. Uh, we do see some plaque formation. We see it uh, occurring right around the vascular networks. Um, in, in a previous study with an endothelial model layer, we were able to demonstrate that. And we're also able to show that the that the A beta being secreted by the cells has an adverse effect on the permeability of the vasculature. So, you know, as I as I started out saying, you know, it's it very much depends on what aspect of organ function that you're interested in. Um, I, we do a lot of work with both Linda Griffith and also Ron Weiss at MIT uh, in terms of liver uh, function. And I would say that we are still a ways away from being able to recapitulate true liver function, although it's close enough so that the pharmaceutical companies are already using these liver uh, either engineered models, somewhat less the organoid models, but we're starting to use them too, um, for looking at things like uh, toxicity of um, therapeutics, uh, off-target effects. Um, so. It's, it's successful enough, I guess that's a, maybe a good measure that the pharmaceutical companies are now starting to come to us and say, we, we want your models. We're interested in using your models for a variety of different uh, uh, purposes, ranging from uh, toxicology to disease models to uh, drug discovery. So I think, you know, that's, it's rapidly going in the right direction. And there are some questions in the chat box, like uh, the first question is, does the microfluidic device channel dimension have any effect on the diffusional phenomena while working on yeah. 3D vascularized diffusional model? Really good question. Um, we use models that range, um, the critical dimension seems to be the height. So we have devices that go from about 120 microns up all the way up to about one millimeter. Um, and the biggest problem there is that as we seed the cells initially, they tend to settle down to the bottom. So uh, as long as we rotate the system as the gel is, is polymerizing, uh, we don't see that there's much difference in the behavior. Um, the other aspect is the width and, and you know whether we can go from these systems that are 
you know, start out maybe being 200 microns by a millimeter by, or by a few millimeters by one millimeter. Um, can we scale that up to centimeter scale? Um, we haven't tried yet, um, primarily because, you know, when you go up, uh, the cell number that's required goes up dramatically. Uh, you know, it goes up as the cube of the linear dimension. Um, but we haven't found any limitation in terms of uh, any size constraints. Things see, the right results seem to scale very well, um, suggesting that uh, this method could conceivably be used to generate even more macro scale organ systems uh, that could ultimately be used for implantation. Uh, one of the limitations is that if you go to a larger system, at least with the method that we use, it's still capillary sized vessels. And they're in the body, you don't have capillaries that go over a centimeter distance. So um, we would need to have some combine our method with a method, for example, that Jennifer Lewis is using at, at Harvard for printing vessels on larger scale uh, so that we could have more of a hierarchical vascular network going from arterioles to capillaries to venules. Uh, and that we haven't done. We're starting to move in that direction, but I think there are methods in which that could be done as well. Great question. Though. Thank you. And one more question that is, uh, what is the difference between the mice uh, ALS model and the uh, three-dimensional microfluidic ALS model, which can closely mimic the original condition? And can we compare the mice one and with the your 3D based? There, there really isn't a good mouse ALS model, uh, at least that, not that I've seen. Um, uh, that's one of the problems. It's it's really been motivating companies. Uh, the company that sponsored our work was uh, Biogen, and they came to us because they didn't have a good a good model for for screening drugs. Um, there there are models that I think recapitulate some aspects of ALS, but but uh, uh, I don't think they've been very successful in terms of screening, um, and. It's it's a lot easier with um, you know with cancer for example because you can take the human tumor and you can implant it into the mouse and then you can use different therapeutic agents against that tumor. Um, with ALS, you know you need to have um, the, the pathology to begin with, and uh, again, as far as I know, there's no good mouse model for ALS. And there are some other questions uh, like the hydrogels that you are used are uh, whether protocols linked hydrogels. With cells on it, or the cells are being added after the hydrogels are placed in the microfluidic model. So we typically use natural uh, matrix materials, either fibrin or collagen, uh, and the cells are suspended in the, the gel solution before we inject it into um, in, into the device. So it's not on top of, of the system. We've we've done somewhat work with. Um, we're starting to work now a little bit with photocross linkable gels. Uh, just so that we can have better control over the mechanical properties and maybe over the um, uh, composition of the matrix. But I've always steered away from that a little bit because, um, as, as I showed, the, the cells secrete a lot of matrix material even within a week's time or 10 days' time. So during, if you're going to use a model for that length of time, what you start with is not going to be what you have uh, a week or two weeks later on. So my feeling is that the cells are going to secrete a matrix that they want to, that's, that they see as their desirable microenvironment. Uh, and I would rather have that than have a, a synthetic matrix. But there's a tremendous amount of work going on in terms of developing synthetic matrices. In fact, my close colleague, Linda Griffith, is doing a lot of that work, looking at peg gels, for example. And we're also we're working together with her now to see whether we can vascularize her peg gels. Turns out it's not that easy. Uh, there are certain features associated with uh, either ligands that are presented by the by the by the natural gels uh, or mechanical properties uh, that are not being recapitulated by the um, by the peg gels right at, at present. So um, it's a work in progress. I think the synthetic gels will eventually will will we'll figure out what the what the magical signals are that we need to provide them with. But so far, we can't we can't form vascular networks inside them. One question: that how elasticity of the microvasculature is maintained in the tissue model? 
Well, it's just like um, any gel. You know, as long as that gel just sits there and isn't being degraded, it's going to maintain its elastic properties unless it uh, somehow ages. Um, in our case, you have the cells present. So the cells are doing two things. You know, they're degrading the matrix. They have a lot of MMPs, these matrix metalloproteases. Um, but they also synthesize a lot of matrix. So there's what appears to be somewhat of a balance that exists in, in most of the systems that we've developed, where the secretion, if anything, exceeds the degradation rate. So the matrix stiffness tends to go up. Um, we do see, if you, I went over this kind of quickly, but in the um, uh, confocal reflectance image, you could see there were, there were, it's like Swiss cheese. There are holes in the matrix at certain regions, and there are other regions where it was, where it was more dense. Uh, the holes, I think, are regions where there was a vessel at one point, and then that, that, re that vessel regressed as the, best, as the vascular network stabilized. Um, so certainly there are changes, but in terms of the elasticity, um, as we demonstrated with the AFM measurements, uh, the, the stiffness actually goes up. Uh, and then it looks like it stabilizes. We haven't gone out very long, but we've gone out about two weeks. And between at least about a you know one week and two week period, uh, things seem to have leveled off in terms of the elastic modulus of the material. Uh, the other thing that is interesting there is that when you you start with a, a, a matrix, it's really it's goo. It's, it's it's got a low, very low modulus, 100 pascal. You, you couldn't you couldn't pick it up. After 10 days, and you open up the device, you can actually pick up the matrix and, and the whole system with a with forceps. And you can even take that and you can stretch it 50% without without rupturing. So the mechanical properties are totally different uh, after about a week, which uh, you know was amazing to us that it was that much different. Um, but we expected to see some differences due to due to the change changes induced by the cells. Maybe one last question: Like, uh, uh, is, have we ever experienced any effect of uh, mechanical properties of the gels in the differentiation of iPSC cells in order to other specific cells where it hinders the experiment? So most of the differentiation of the iPS cells we do prior to introducing into a uh, a, a matrix or into a microfluidic system. Um, I guess one exception is the ALS model, where the, the muscle cells are differentiated into myoblasts first um, outside of the system. And then we inject them into the system, and then they coalesce around the uh, posts, and then they continue to differentiate for another two weeks. Um, In that case, we allow the differentiation to occur in what's essentially a gel-free environment, so it's just media around them. We replace that media with a gel once the differentiation is fully completed. Uh, certainly, the, the differentiation process would be affected by the matrix, and, and you know that's been demonstrated in a number of different studies. Uh, in so many cases, you you know, you, you require matrogel uh, for the, the spheroids uh, for differentiation of the IPS. Um, and matrogel, you know, it's one of these substances that isn't well-defined. So we're trying to get away from matrogel as much as possible. And actually, in most of the studies that we do now, the differentiation is, is done in a matrogel-free process. Uh, but there's so many different protocols now. Um, certainly, the matrix surrounding the cells does make a difference. And that's one of the things that you can control uh, potentially to your advantage or maybe to your disadvantage. Um, but it's not something I think that people have really explored uh, very thoroughly. You might want to take a look at some of the work from Ming Guo, who's in our mechanical engineering department. Um, and he's done some interesting work looking at uh, stem cell differentiation. So I think with this question, like we can uh, end the session, like, uh, and uh, I thank uh, Professor Roger for his uh, wonderful lecture and also sharing his valuable time out of his busy schedule and addressing the student questions and it's a really interesting and uh, it's motivated our students and as well as the faculty colleagues uh, we learned a lot from your lecture and yeah if you have further questions we will disturb you by email and uh, we'll be in touch with you and once Please again do. i thank you very much for uh, providing this wonderful opportunity to host you and uh, and to uh, got opportunity to listen to your wonderful lecture thank you very much uh, for accepting your request and delivering the lecture Maybe we can Thanks, end the session.
and we'll see you once again once the situation is normal we can see uh, instead of virtually we can see it personally in our institute by zoom i hope so i look forward yeah. to that thank you everyone thank you everyone okay. stay safe and happy bye thank you bye bye